Introduction to Windows 7 is the first chapter in the course Windows OS and Application Support, which maps to the Microsoft Exam 70-685. In this course, students will learn to identify the major parts in the computer, identify the ports on the computer, list the requirements for Windows 7, install Windows 7, configure system settings for Windows 7 using the control panel, manage your services using the services console, review basic troubleshooting methodology, use system properties and system information to view system hardware and configuration, and use the event viewer to view the computer logs. Lesson 1 is an introduction to Windows. Different from the other lessons, it does not cover any specific objectives that are on the exam. However, it will cover some basic yet essential skills which will be used in objectives shown in the rest of the book. In addition, the 70-685 exam does not cover installing Windows 7. However, this book covers it because it starts the lab out with a fresh computer and review the system requirements will help when discussing performance. For some of you, Lesson 1 will be review since you would have taken a basic hardware and or basic Windows class and you have or you have had experiences playing with computers and Windows. Windows 7, the bottom line here is Windows 7 is the newest version of the Microsoft Windows operating system. Windows 7 was released to manufacturing on July 22, 2009 and reached general retail availability on October 22, 2009. Less than three years after the release of its predecessor, Windows Vista. The first part of the chapter gives a brief history of what was led to, of what led to Windows 7. As mentioned in the chapter, Windows XP was around for five years before Windows Vista came out. In addition, Windows XP was a huge success in both the commercial and home markets. Corporations quickly embraced Windows XP and it became their standard platform. Since many corporations will run popular applications such as Microsoft Office, they will often have customized applications that were written for Windows XP. Unfortunately for them, some of these applications will not run on Windows Vista or Windows 7. Therefore, it takes time and effort to test the applications to make sure they are compatible and it will take more time, effort, and money to have these applications upgraded. In addition, compared to Windows XP, the Windows Vista and 7 interfaces are significantly different. Therefore, there is also a learning curve for the users, which would also increase the number of help desk calls. Anytime you talk about computers and networks, you should discuss security. So when Windows Vista was introduced, many of changes to Windows Vista and Windows 7 was designated to make Windows more secure. Sometimes to make a system more secure you might have to give it a little give up a little bit such as the UAC or user account access prompts and incompatibility with older software. Before we discuss software we should give a brief overview of the hardware that the system will run on. This section divides the system into four major subsystems processor, memory, storage, and network. By reviewing these subsystems we can see how these components affect the overall stability and performance of Windows. It will also lead into the later lesson that discusses troubleshooting hardware devices. When discussing processors, keep in mind that they have changed significantly over the last decade or so. Initially, the clock speed was the primary factor for a measurement of performance. Since then, processors have gotten more complex and they have many storage units, multiple mathematical units, and even multiple cores. We should also look at the differences between 32-bit and 64-bit processors, such as how much RAM can be addressed by each. For example, a 32-bit processor is capable of addressing up to 4 gigabytes of RAM, while the 64-bit processor can address up to 16 exabytes 
Also, some software may not run on 64-bit processors that were written for the 32-bit processors. In particular, in particular is the 32-bit drivers will not function on a 64-bit processor. RAM can be described as the computer's short-term temper short-term memory. RAM is not a place to skimp. As computers have matured and operating systems and applications have matured, these objects have required more and more memory through the years. This trend will most likely continue. Therefore, if you want decent performance and you want stability, you need to have sufficient memory. This is probably the most inexpensive way to boost performance of your PC. Drives are the primary storage devices. Since most drives are part mechanical drives, they can have high failure uh, rates. This is a point that will be mentioned later when discussing troubleshooting hardware devices. Keep in mind if you're going to install Windows 7, use the installation DVD. You, of course, will also need a DVD drive. The last major subsystem is the network connection. Older systems will most likely have 100 megabit network interfaces, while today's computers will include a gigabit network interface or a wireless network interface. Today, most activity done on the computer requires network connectivity. Even most home users depend on an internet connection, and corporate users need to share files and printers, access emails, and access various network applications. The motherboard is the primary component that brings all the other components together. In my opinion, this is the most important component in your system. The motherboard will also limit which processors you can use and how much memory the system will recognize. Remember, ROM or read-only memory chips hold software instructions. Like any other software, the BIOS, basic input-output system, may need to be patched and updated from time to time. To update a BIOS, you will be flashing the BIOS. So when we look at flashing the BIOS, the general process involves going to the manufacturer website, downloading the appropriate BIOS update for your system, and running a software application on your machine that will rewrite the BIOS firmware and update it. Keep in mind not to power cycle your machine in the middle of updating your BIOS. You could end up with a dead motherboard. The next components that are covered are power supplies and case. You must still ensure that the power supply can supply enough power to the entire system including any devices that you have added. In addition, many systems are now designated to be more green, which means that they are designed to run more efficiently with less power. So this is a good time to think about the difference between mobile components as, compo as compared to desktop components. Mobile components or laptop components are usually designed to run a lesser voltage and can consume less power. Since most computers are designed to be expandable, this next section covers ports. Any desktop technician should be able to identify common ports on the computer and know what type of device you would connect to each port. Things like our parallel port, keyboard or a PS2 port, also known as a mini DIN keyboard port, serial port RS-232, Look like, looks like we have a cover over a built-in VGA connection here. We have a Firewire IEEE 1394 port here. USB, Ethernet, RG45 port. Here we have a VGA. Notice the VGA blue with three rows of five or 15 pins. This is a, a video, S-video out. And then we have a DVI video connector. And over here, it looks like we have a RJ11 for a modem.
The last two systems discussed are the video system and the sound system. For gamers, the video system is the primary system that will contribute to gaming performance. You will also need to have a more advanced video card with sufficient memory if you want to support Windows Aerial. Here we can see a description of a sound card, of course, today with gaming systems and so forth. We want to be able to have some sound 